Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast, the show where we seek to uncover what leadership means in today's world. I'm Joe Hart, CEO of Dale Carnegie, and we will be talking to diverse leaders with stories to tell across various industries to help unlock your potential for success. We will be sharing real life insights into leadership, which in turn can help spark the next level of your growth as a leader. Today's guest is a world-renowned executive coach and a New York Times best-selling author. He has been ranked as the world's number one executive coach and top 10 business thinker for eight years. He has sold millions of copies of his books and even had the world's top executive coaching award named after him. He served on the advisory board of the Peter Drucker Foundation for 10 years He's been a volunteer teacher for U.S. Army generals, Navy admirals, Girl Scout executives, and leaders of the International and American Red Cross, where he was the National Volunteer of the Year. We are excited to welcome Marshall Goldsmith. Marshall, welcome to the Dale Carnegie Take Command podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Well, thank you. And not as happy as I am. It's such a pleasure to meet you and to be with you and especially having had the opportunity to read your books and to know the significant impact you've had on so many people. You've been not only a best-selling author and an executive coach to some of the top leaders in the world. Uh, We've also got a new book coming out that I'm sure will be a best-selling book. So we've got a lot that we can discuss about you and about leadership and about the new book. Before we do, Tell us a little bit about you. I know that you spent a number of years in academia and teaching before you became an executive coach. What was that journey like? Well, I'm from a small town called Valley Station, Kentucky. Went to a little engineering school at Rose Holman Institute of Technology. Got an MBA at Indiana U, PhD at UCLA. Was a college professor and dean when I was very young. And then I met a very famous guy named Dr. Paul Hersey, H-E-R-S-E-Y. He, with Ken Blanchard, invented situational leadership. And I was smart enough to follow him around and literally serving coffee and carrying bags. And I just wanted to learn from him. And one day he got double booked and he said, can you do what I do? I said, I don't know. He said, I'll pay a thousand dollars for a day. I was making $15,000 for a year. That was 45 years ago. I said, sign me up, coach. I did a program for the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company in New York. They were so angry when I showed up because it wasn't him but I got ranked first place of all the speakers. So after that, they called him up and said, you want to do it again? I said, I'll do it again. That's how I got into leadership development and then coaching. I met a CEO and he said, I got this kid working for us, young, smart, hardworking, dedicated jerk. Be worth a fortune to me to turn his kid around. And I said, well, I'd like fortunes and maybe I can help him. He said, I doubt it. I came up with an idea. I said, I'll work with him for a year. If he gets better, pay me. If he doesn't get better, it's free. You know what he said? Sold. There was nothing called coaching. There was nothing called executive coach. I just made that up. <laughs> so I've been very, very fortunate. And I think so blessed. One of the people that you've talked about is Alan Mulally, who just changed my life. Uh, such a great human being. And, you know, Paul Hersey and Ken Blanchard, Francis Hesselbein, other great people I've had the privilege to get to work with. You've worked with amazing people. And I definitely want to ask you about that. Just to go back for a second, you've really kind of defined in many ways, the coaching industry. You were, as you said, one of the very first, if not the very first coaches. What was it about you that enabled you to be able to be so effective at that? I mean, did you always have this ability to bring out the best in others? How did you do that? How did you define this space? You know, I think a couple of things happened. One is, again, I was a pioneer on 360 feedback. And I talk about this in my new book, Kent Cressa Changed My Life. He was the CEO of a company called Northrop back in the day, now it's Northrop Grumman. And we did feedback for all these people. And he said, does this stuff actually work? Does anybody ever really change? I said, you know, I have a background in math. I said, I can't have research to prove it. So I guess I really don't know. But I said, I'll find out. Well, I spent the next year and a half just studying who get better, who didn't get better, why they got better and why they didn't get better. And I really found out that the key is people have to follow up and stick with it. They don't get better just because they read a book or go to a course, they have to work. And that the people that did the work got better and the people that didn't do the work, not surprisingly, they didn't get worse, they just stayed the same. So that led to the whole 360 feedback follow-up, which again led to coaching, which kind of all evolved. 
and as you've gone along, you mentioned going back that you've coached some incredible people and gotten to know some incredible people. Talk about a couple of those. I mean, Alan Mulally is someone who I've had the pleasure to work with and get to know. My example of one of the greatest leaders of our time. What was it like to work with Alan? And what did you learn in the process? You said he's taught you a lot. Well, to start with, I was Alan's coach when he was at a Boeing commercial aircraft. And so I was Alan's coach and I explained my coaching process to Alan and Alan's a great engineer. So he said, well, if I do this and this and this and this, it leads to this and this and this and that. And I said, that's about it. He said, is there something else to this? I said, not really. He said, well, you know, Marshall, I built the Boeing 777 airplane. It was very complicated. He said, I think I can carry this boat. I worked with him about three months. It's pretty obvious he's going to get better and I'm going to get paid. So I said, well, Alan, it's a little embarrassing. I'm charging Boeing a lot of money here. And I'm not doing much. I spend very little time with you. You got this, obviously. How can we pick this up? He said, why don't we help everybody get better? So then I started not only helping him get better, 200 people got better. I learned so much from him. He changed my life and he actually changed the field of coaching. I said, Alan, of all the people I've coached. So I said, I spent the least amount of time coaching you and you improved the most. And I said, Alan, I made a chart. And by the way, the guy I spent the most amount of time with didn't improve at all. I made a chart on one dimension, time spent with executive coach Marshall Goldsmith and the other mentioned improvement. I said, Alan, the way this chart looks, had you never met me, you'd really be good. <laughs> so I said, what should I learn about coaching from you? He said, Marshall, your whole challenge was a coach is client selection. You pick the right customers, your coaching process will always work. You pick the wrong customer, your coaching process will never work. And he said, don't make coaching about yourself and your own ego and how smart you think you are. Make it about the great people you work with, and how proud you are of them. I'll tell you, that changed my life and it changed the field of coaching. So if you look at my new book, The Earned Life, you see who's given endorsements. You see Alan Mulally and Francis Hesselbein and Albert Berla from Pfizer and Hubert Jolie and just amazing people on and on. I'm so proud of that. You know why? 30 years ago, no one would admit to having a coach. They would have been ashamed or embarrassed to have a coach. And today, coaching is seen as something to help great people get better. So that's one of the things I'm very proud of, is just helping great people get better. It's interesting to go back, like you said, it used to be that if someone needed a coach, maybe there was something wrong with them. That was the perception. Now it has changed so that having a coach really is an investment in the person. It's something that's well-received and so forth. Do you find that the people today are more receptive to coaching, The people want coaches? And what do you look for in the attributes of someone who's really well set up to be well coached? Well, number one, yes. I mean, the coaching business is huge now. There's thousands and thousands of people in the coaching business, as opposed to almost no one back in the day. So the responsiveness to coaching is exponentially different. I've also thought, what are the qualities of a great client? Because really, my success or failure is my clients. And again, I got ranked number one executive coach forever. Well, nobody knows if I'm a good coach. I can't say I'm the best coach. But I can't say I've got the best clients. To be honest, anybody's got to look like a good coach if they coach people. I do. <laughs> people are so good. <laughs> anybody's going to look like a good coach. Well, I just followed Alan's advice. I just work with great, great people. And to me, three things that are important to answer your question. One is courage. Everyone I coach gets confidential feedback. It can be very hard to look at this feedback. It takes courage to look in the mirror. Two, it takes humility. I can't help a perfect person get better. So he's perfect. They don't need me. And then three, it takes discipline. And that's where Alan really stands out. The day-to-day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day -to -day discipline, keep doing stuff over and over and over again and making it work. So you mentioned his BPR process, you know, business plan review process, week after week after week. In my new book, I talk about that. I talk about Alan's process. And now I developed a process called the LPR, the Life Plan Review, which is basically applying his methodology to working with individuals and coaching. That's brilliant. I can only imagine how that would work because the same model, and I've talked to him about that. I think he had used his BPR for personal improvement and other kinds of things. Your system now is basically modeling that for individuals to improve. Well, over COVID, I had the privilege with my friend Mark Thompson. We spent up 400 hours every weekend. We spent with 60 amazing people. 
And I can tell you who they were. I mean, these included Curtis Martin, the great football star, and then Pal Gasol, the great basketball star, Telly Leung, Broadway star. We had the CEO of the Olympic Committee, CEO of Russell Investments, Cardinal Health, just on and on. Rockefeller Foundation, World Bank, amazing people. And every weekend, we would practice a process like the BPR. They would stand up. They would give a report card on their lives. Here's what I'm proud of. Here's what I want to do better. Then they asked for something called feed forward. They say, please give me suggestions. People give them suggestions. They say, thank you. And people loved it. They just loved it because, you know, there's no saying it's lonely at the top. It used to be lonely at the top. It's lonelier at the top today. It's tough. You know, social media, people can laugh at you. It's hard. They loved it. And so it's been a wonderful process. And again, in my book, I talk about how I learned from Alan and incorporated what I learned from him into my coaching. Well, it's interesting when you talk about Alan, I think about just incredible integrity and character and values. And he really models values. Is that also something that's part of the LPR process? Do people go through kind of a discernment then to decide who do I want to be and what do I stand for? Is that part of the system? It is. One of the things I teach is something called the daily question process where you get a spreadsheet, you write down a series of questions to represent what's most important in your life. And then every day you fill it out. Every question is a yes, no, or number, seven boxes across. The end of the week, you get a report card. And it's very humbling. It's hard to do this. Most people quit in two weeks. It's just very, very humbling to do this because all uh, life is easy to talk and hard to live. And you do this every week. You're looking at not those talking values. You're looking at those living values. And we all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And it's humbling to actually realistically look at yourself during the week and then get it up in front of these other people. And we did groups of eight or 10 and they'd stand up, you know, my name is, here's what I did well. Here's what I want to do better. Here's what I learned. Please help me over and over again. You're making it objective and you create this level of accountability that sounds like it's a very important part of that process. Should everyone in business have a coach? And is there anyone who shouldn't have a coach? How do you feel about that? Well, it depends. I don't like to get into semantic arguments about what is a coach or what isn't a coach. I just help people achieve positive long-term change in leadership behavior. So basically, I only work with people that care. If people don't care, I mean, it's a waste of my time. Number two, the issue has to be behavioral. So I can't solve intellectual or technical problems. I got a call from a pharmaceutical company. We want you to coach Dr. X. I said, what's his problem? They said, he's not updated on recent medical technology. I said, neither am I. <laughs> I can't make a bad doctor a good doctor. A behavioral coaching only solves behavioral issues. I say, never coach integrity problems. You mentioned integrity. You don't coach an integrity problem. You fire an integrity problem. The integrity is not a performance appraisal issue. It's a condition of employment issue. So I don't coach anyone that has integrity problems. I don't think that's right. And, you know, they have to be willing to try and they have to be given a fair chance. The company has to really give them a fair chance. And if the issue is behavioral and they're willing to try and they're willing to get a fair chance, my coaching process always works. I've never seen it fail. Part of what I also know you do is you're trying to teach your coaching process. You've got your 100 coaches program and you are a huge proponent in paying it forward. And part of that paying it forward is really trying to teach coaches how to coach and teach your process. And you want them to do the same thing and to keep on paying it forward. What are the attributes of a good coach when you think about coaching? Because I think all of us as leaders want to be good coaches. My job is to help bring out the best in the people with whom I work. So what are the things you look for in deciding whether someone is really suited to be a great coach, a great mentor, so to speak, for others? I think you kind of answered your own question because, and again, I'm quoting Alan, it's not about me, it's about them. You know, Alan told me, don't make coaching about yourself and your own ego and how smart you think you are. Make it about the great people you work with. The people that are motivated, care, and really help them as best you can. Don't make it about you though. It's a great perspective always for us even Try to be thinking about the other person. In what ways can we serve? In what ways can we help? And I know you are a person who's very humble and very service oriented. So that makes a lot of sense. Your new book focuses on a lot of it's about regrets and right. how to overcome regrets. And certainly, you know, many people, all of us at different times can be burdened by things, burdened by mistakes or things that have happened mm. in the past. Tell us a little bit about more about the book and what's your focal point or your thoughts around this topic of regret and how we can overcome things that are regrets. 
Well, a couple points in the book I'll talk about. The first one is called the every breath paradigm. So I'm a, not a religious, but a philosophical Buddhist. And Buddha said, every time I take a deep breath, it's a new me. Well, that's a key point of the book is we live in a world of impermanence. You take a breath, you're starting over again in life. And the idea of that every breath thing is very helpful. It's a new me. It's a new me. It's a new me. As we go through life, we're always starting over. And you can look at the previous renditions of you as the previous you's. And one thing I love about Dale Carnegie is you teach people, don't stereotype yourself. You know, don't say I'm no good at. That's just the way I am. Well, that indicates they can't change. We can all change. You know that. And so very important to say, every time I take a breath, it's a new me. And I get a chance to start over. And what's healthy about that is, number one, you're much better at forgiving yourself for previous sins. That was a previous rendition of you, and they made some mistakes. And the other thing, though, is you don't live in the past. You don't sit there and talk about the football game you won 30 years ago. You don't live in the past. You live in the future. So that's a big part of the book. The other part of the book talks about the connection. The part that's really had the most impact on people is a connection between our aspirations, our ambitions, and our actions. Our aspirations are the deeper purpose, the higher meaning. Why are we here? What's it all for? And our aspirations don't have a timeline. Our ambitions are achievement of goals, which do have a timeline. And then our actions are day-to-day -day activities. They're immediate now. And really, assuming you have middle-class income, assuming that you're healthy and assuming you have good relationship with people you love. If you have a good sense of purpose in life, a deeper aspiration two, your achievements are connected to that. And three, you love the process. You just won the game of life. And it's important to connect the three. Now, historically, human beings have been what I'd say more in the action phase. They live day to day lives. Historically, our ancestors didn't have a lot of choices. They kind of did what they were told. They went where they were supposed to go. Their lives were reasonably programmed, and they were pretty much in the action day-to-day -day phase. Some people are more lost in their heads. They're living in the aspiration phase. They're lofty ideas. They don't achieve a lot, but they've got a lot of big, grandiose ideas. The people I coach and the people you work with, and probably you, are focused on achievement and ambition achievement phase. And they like to achieve goals. The people that I work with are phenomenal goal achievers. And one of the deepest points in the book is do not become attached to the end results of what you're doing. Never become ego attached to the end results of what you're doing for a couple of reasons. One, you don't have total control over those results. You don't control all the results. Many variables kick in that you don't know about. And then number two, what happens after you achieve the results? Well, if you're not careful, let's make you happy for 10 minutes. And then you got to achieve another result and another result and another result. So very important that I teach in a book, don't become attached to the outcomes of what you do. And that's hard for high achievers. In our society, we're brought up with this one message over and over, the great Western art form. You may have heard it before. It sounds like this. There is a person person is sad. Oh, they spend money. They buy a product and they become happy. This is called a commercial. I don't know if you've ever heard one of those, but we are bombarded with that message. Well, the reality is the message we're always given is it's out there. Happiness is out there. When I get the money, get the achievement, I get the status, I get the BMW. Happiness is out there. Not happiness is in here. And the book talks about happiness is not out there. You can look all you want to. You're not going to find it because as soon as you find it, you just have to find something else. One of the people endorsed the book is Albert Berla. Albert's a CL Pfizer. I said, how was your year last year? Well, pretty good. You came up with this vaccine. That was a big deal. Saved a billion lives and CEO of the year and employee engagement, company pride, on and on. I said, Albert, what's your problem? He said, I have a huge problem next year. Well, that doesn't stop. If your value as a human being is you have to do better than last year, Albert will never do better than last year. I don't want him to do better than last year. We don't want to have another pandemic. He'll never do better than last year. That's why the ex-athletes don't do very well. Michael Phelps thought about killing himself. Why? He couldn't beat last year. Well, you can't really get into that game for two reasons. One, you can't beat last year. And two, you can forget to enjoy life. 
You can forget the day-to-day process of life. One of my favorite parts of the book talks about the marshmallow study. Remember the marshmallow study? You take the kid, you give the kid a marshmallow. You say to the kid, eat one, you get one. But wait, you get two. Well, allegedly they did longitudinal studies and the kid that eat one becomes a drug addict and the kid that waits goes to Harvard and gets an MBA. I think they exaggerated a little bit, but the point of it is very clear. Delayed gratification is good. Over and over, delayed gratification is good. Workout, diet, delayed gratification is good. Well, in the book I talk about it's sometimes good. See, what they didn't do in that research is they didn't take the kid that had two marshmallows, say, wait a bit longer, kid, three. Wait some more, four, five, 10, a thousand. Where do you end up? An old man waiting to die in a room surrounded by thousands of uneaten marshmallows. Sometimes you got to eat the marshmallow. <laughs> it's a powerful reminder of perspective, too. There's a balance in life. I love what you're saying, and I can't wait to read the book. How do you help people? Because a lot of what you're saying, to me goes to mindset. You know, if people have the right way to frame things, if my view is, look, every breath is a new me and I've won the game of life. And by the way, if we look at things in the proper perspective, we've got a lot to be grateful for just as human beings, so much. And yet we know that there is so much depression and anxiety and stress and self-esteem issues and so forth. And a lot of these things are emotional. How do you help people start to gain that proper perspective? Or what advice would you give to someone if they're in that place right now, and maybe they're down, they're beaten up, they're burned out from the past couple of years, all the challenges and the current challenges? Well, the first thing is you can't change the past. I've got a million four followers on LinkedIn, I think. And the quote that people like the best is this, forgive other people for being who they are and forgive yourself for believing that they were someone else. What I tell people is, look, breathe. Whatever happened in the past happened. We all made mistakes. But think of all the previous versions of you. Think of the gifts they've given you that's here. Think about how hard they tried. Think about the good things they did. If anybody did that many good things, what should you say? Just say thank you. Did they make mistakes? Of course. Now, one thing I talk about in the book that I think is really overlooked I literally ask thousands of parents, when my child grows up, I want my child to be, give me one word. One word comes up from parents, one word more than every other word combined, no matter what country I'm in. What's that word? Happy. Okay, here's what I tell people. You want your kid to be happy? You want your parents to be happy? You want the people that love you to be happy? You go first. You be happy. That's a really important part of the book is getting people to focus on their own happiness. In my book, Triggers, I have a great example. I talk about, and I can't mention their names, three of the medical doctors I coached, three of the smartest people I ever met. One is Dr. Jim Kim. Now, Dr. Jim has a simultaneous MD and PhD with honors in anthropology from Harvard in five years. Let's put this in context. A normal human to get a PhD in anthropology from Harvard takes eight years. So he got one in five years and got an MD at the same time. He went on to be president of Dartmouth and head of the World Bank. Dr. Raj Shah was head of the United States Agency for International Development at age 37, reported to Hillary Clinton. Now he's head of the Rockefeller Foundation. And Dr. John Noseworthy is CEO of the Mayo Clinic. So when the brains were passed out, these three guys are not at the back of the line. All three, I ask him a question. On an average day, how would you score in the answer to this question? Did I do my best to be happy today? And they all had the same answer. Never dawned on me to try to be happy. It never dawned on me to try to be happy. I was too busy achieving things. Now they're all medical doctors. So I said, did it dawn on you, you're gonna die? Did they cover that one in medical school? Death, did they bring that up? They said, oh oh, yeah, they covered that in medical school. I said, do you think this is a silly question or trivial question? No, I forgot to ask. One of the great people in our group is Asafi Bakal. Asafi wrote a book called Loon Shots. Brilliant guy, worth tens of millions of dollars, started businesses, consulted the president's PhD in physics from Stanford, has an IQ equal to probably the two of us combined. Just a brilliant guy, right? He said he learned one thing in all of our time together. You know what he learned? He talks like a scientist. He said, I used to believe that happiness was a dependent variable based on achievement. And if I achieve, I will be happy. What he said I learned is happiness and achievement are independent variables. 
achieve to achieve, be happy to be happy, but never believe I'm going to be happy after I achieve. If achievement would make you happy, those 60 people I spend every weekend with would all be dancing off the ceilings. Look at Safi. I said, Safi, how much do you have to achieve? If you haven't achieved enough now, you're a 99.99 already in terms of achievement. You really believe going to a 99.999 is going to make any difference? You think you're going to get happier because you achieve more? It's ridiculous. How much do you have to achieve? He said, you're right. It's ridiculous. I guess part of the question is everything you're saying is logical. It makes 100% sense. You know, some of this is so hardwired into us in terms of who we are. We identify with our achievements. We identify with our roles. I had a conversation last night with a dear friend of mine, someone I've known for decades, who is struggling about saying, you know, I'm unhappy in this job. I can afford to leave the job. My parents are older and need my help. I'm just afraid that if I do this right now, then I become irrelevant because there's such a connection between identity and happiness and feeling important and feeling worthwhile. How do you help people? It's hardwired for years, right? So we're talking about rewiring for a lot of people. Well, the first thing in Dale Carnegie I like is you don't believe people are hardwired. You do believe people can change. That's a key component of Dale Carnegie. Absolutely. Is. And so we change attitudes and mindsets as well. Yep. Anybody that does not have an incurable genetic defect can get better to start with. Number two, you really need to watch out for this, what I call referent group. Who are all these people that are not going to think so much of him? And do they actually care about him anyway? If their value in him is he has to do a miserable job to look impressive, is that really your friend? Why are you trying to impress these people? If really, you have to have a job you don't like in order to impress people. They're not your friends anyway. And so why are you wasting time on that? And the other thing I would say to him is, whose life is it? In the book, the new book, The Earned Life, I talk about friend Mark Tersick. Mark was at Goldman Sachs for the IPO. He's one of the top people. He made a zillion dollars. Then he wanted to become president of the Nature Conservative. We had the same conversation. You know, we said, well, I'm not sure. What will people think? You know, I said, what do you care what they think? You're leaving this to do good. If somebody's going to hold that against you, why are you worry about that? Why are you trying to impress them for? It's not worth it. It's true. And yet you talked earlier about how it's so lonely, lonelier today at the top, maybe than it's ever been. I think about our kids. I think about our young people who struggle with social media and just all oh. the identity and the challenges. How do I look in comparison? You get into this comparison trap and so forth. So what I'm looking at is certainly this is what we, as you said, with Dale Carnegie, we work with a lot of these kind of people, young people and others who need this kind of help. And I know this is what you're trying to do as well in this book. What would you say to someone right now if they're listening to this and they're like, gosh, Marshall, I love what you're saying. I really want to stop work, start working on this. And at the same time, it's not easy. It takes time. Oh, it's not easy. I practice a daily question process every day. I have someone call me on the phone every day to make sure I do this stuff every day for 25 years. Why? I am too cowardly to do this stuff by myself. I'm too undisciplined to do this stuff by myself. I need help. And you know what? It's okay. It's okay. I need help. Twilight Tharp is the greatest choreographer probably that ever lived. She's had the same personal trainer for 27 years. The trainer doesn't teach her anything new. The trainer just makes sure she works out. Why? My name is Twilight Tharp. I need help. All those people I coach. Hey, I'm the CEO of the year. I need help. We all need help. We all need help at such an important point. And especially many young leaders will think that it's a mark against them if they seek help, if they don't have all the answers. I've tried to tell people, I know you have too, which is, you know, we all need help. We need to have that sense of humility to say we don't have all the answers and we need other people to help hold us accountable as well. You mentioned Alan Mulally, but talk about a role model. He goes to Ford. He's not an expert on building cars, but what would Alan always say to himself? If I am not the expert on this topic, why am I speaking? Let's talk to the expert. When I coach people, especially CEOs, their suggestions tend to become orders. And if CEO makes stupid suggestion, people just salute the flag and go do it. You know, well, not Alan. He's a very smart man. I'm not the expert on this topic. Someone else knows more than me. It's okay. 
it's okay they know more than me. Let's get them involved. It's not a contest. We're not having a smartness contest here. Yeah, I think what you're saying is very important, very important to get over that egotistical, I have to be the world's expert on everything mindset. Well, I'm so grateful for the body of work that you've developed over the years, because I think it really does go to helping people. And certainly that's been part of your mission is just helping people and unlock the greatness in them. And that's what we do at Dale Carnegie as well. We talk about so many amazing leaders that you've worked with, and maybe mm-hmm. there's no one who's worked with as many of these kinds of people as you have. What are some of the qualities that you see in the greatest leaders? Well, I'm not an expert on all elements of leadership. I don't know anything about strategy or marketing or lots of other stuff. Just in terms of people improving leadership behavior, though, and increasing their effectiveness, three variables, they have to have courage. It takes courage, they have to have humility, and they have to have discipline. So I would stick with those three. Your book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, has been a bestseller, and it's also something that I think resonates. Even just the title of that book resonates with you. (laughs) What inspired you to write that book? Well, that book has been a winner. Dale Carney, you actually teach that stuff. So I get $150,000 of royalty check from that book last year, 15 years after it came out. So that book has been just ridiculously successful. It sold about a million and a half copies. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. Well, you know, a lot of the inspiration that came from Peter Drucker. He said, we spend a lot of time helping leaders learn what to do. We don't spend enough time helping leaders learn what to stop. Well, a big part of that book is teaching you what to stop. Part of the inspiration came from Alan Mulally, work with great people. So I kind of put those two thoughts together and said, what are the classic challenges that great successful people have? Nobody thought, wait a minute, successful people have problems. What are the problems that come with success? And that's what led to that book. Very, at the time, a totally unique thought, by the way. One of the great problems of successful people is you know, the superstition trap. What's that sound like? I behave this way and I am successful. Therefore, I must be successful because I behave this way. Well, any human or animal will replicate behavior that's followed by positive reinforcement. The more positive reinforcement we get, the more we repeat the behavior. Well, the reality is everyone I coach, you are successful, yes, because you do many things right. And you are successful in spite of doing some things that are stupid. And I've never met anyone that was so spectacular. They had nothing on the in spite of list. We all got a little bit of something on that in spite of list. And, you know, if you don't think you do, go ask your husband, wife, or partner. So, Marshall, you've done so many different things. You've got a new book coming out. What are you most excited about as you think about the years ahead for Marshall Goldsmith? Well, the one thing I've done is spent a lot of time thinking on is my legacy. That's for me a big deal. I went to a program called Design the Life You Love. And it was put on by a woman named Aisha Bursell, one of the world's top designers from Turkey. And she said, who are my heroes? Well, I've already mentioned a lot of them. Peter Drucker, Alan Mulally, Francis Hesselblein, Jim Kim, Paul Hersey. Great teachers. I never charged me any money. They were so kind and generous to me. She said, you should be more like your heroes. I decided to adopt 15 people, teach them all I know for free. And the only price is when they get old, they had to do the same thing. Well, I made a little video and put it on LinkedIn, a little small primitive selfie video. I'm thinking, well, maybe 100 people would apply to be adopted and I'll adopt 15. So far over 18,000 people have applied to be adopted and I've adopted about 370. The program is called 100 Coaches. It's amazing. The people in the program are just amazing people. And the idea is just pay it forward. That basically you can ask anyone for ideas. They give you ideas. You say, thank you. You don't judge and critique. And there's no expectation you pay them money. There's no expectation you owe them a favor. The only expectation you do something nice for somebody else. What is your hope for this? If you think long-term, you extrapolate this out. These 100 people are going to go coach more people and it will keep on branching out? Well, you know, it's fascinating because I didn't go into this with any idea it would be so huge. This is huge. It's like a community. People love it. I mean, the people in the group are just ridiculously great people. Well, you got to realize 18,000 applicants, you can be a little bit picky. And now we have a group called Forefront, which is a younger version of the same group. I was just working on that one today. And, you know, I didn't go into this with any idea that it would grow. I just thought it'd be 15 people. I'm a nice old man stumbling through life. They laugh at my jokes and then they do nice things. And, you know, it's a cycle of life. That's all I thought about. I had no idea this would amount to what it has. 
And now, you know, I just want to hand it off to others and I'm 73. So I think it will kind of grow aside from me on its own. How would our listeners, if they wanted to get involved in any of these opportunities that you have, do that? Send me an email, Marshall at MarshallGoldsmith.com. That's pretty easy. And then, you know, all my stuff is online, www.MarshallGoldsmith.com. You can go there, LinkedIn, YouTube, my new book, The Earned Life. People say, how do I find that? Well, they gave me a million dollar advance. So my guess is it probably will be in a bunch of bookstores. (laughs) Should be easy to find. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'll be in bookstores, Amazon, yeah, whatever. So it shouldn't be that hard to find. Marshall, as you look back over your career, you've learned so many things, you've grown so much, you've shared so much of your wisdom. If you were to be speaking to a younger Marshall Goldsmith or a grandchild, someone you cared about, what advice might you give based on something you didn't know at that time? I'll now share the best coaching advice I'll ever give to anyone. Are you ready? I'm ready. And I think you might teach this in one of your Dale Carnegie classes. Take a deep breath. Imagine you're 95 years old and you're just getting ready to die. And you're on that deathbed. Here comes your last breath. Right before you take that breath, though, you're giving a beautiful gift. The ability to go back in time and talk to the person that's listening to me right now. The ability to help that person be a better leader. Much more important, the ability to help that person have a better life. What advice would the wise 95-year-old you, who knows what really mattered in life and what didn't, what was important and what wasn't, what advice would that wise old person facing death have for the you that's listening to me right now? Just breathe. Whatever you're thinking now, do that. In terms of a performance appraisal, that's the only one that matters. That old person says you did the right thing. Guess what? You did the right thing. That old person says you made a mistake. That's where regret kicks in. You made a mistake. You do not have to impress anyone but that old person. That's it. Some friends of mine interviewed old folks who were facing death. What advice would you have? On the personal side, three themes. Theme number one, I talk a lot about in the book, be happy now. Comment from old people. I got so busy chasing what I did not have, I couldn't see what I did have. And I had almost everything. The great Western disease, I will be happy when I get the achievement, the money, the status, the condominium, the BMW, I will be happy when. Happiness is not out there. It's in here. Be happy now. Happiness is not next week. It's now. Number two is friends and family. Never get so busy climbing the ladder of success, you forget the people who love you. When you're 95 years old, you look around your deathbed, none of your coworkers are waving goodbye. You realize these people are pretty important. And the final one is, if you have a dream, go for it. Because you don't go for it when you're 45. You may not when you're 85. And it doesn't have to be a big one, maybe a small one. Go to New Zealand, speak Spanish, play a guitar. Other people think your dream is goofy. Who cares? It's not their dream. It's your dream. It's not their life. It's your life. Had an embarrassing experience a few years ago. I said, go to New Zealand, speak Spanish. Guy raised his hand and goes, we're in Spain, you idiot. We all speak Spanish. <laughs> business advice isn't much different. Number one, life is short. Have fun. Number two, do whatever you can do to help people. And the main reason to help people has nothing to do with money or status or getting ahead. The main reason to help people is much deeper. The 95-year-old who's going to be proud of you because you did and disappointed if you don't. And the final advice, same, go for it. We seldom regret the risk we take and fail. We usually regret the risk we fail to take. And finally, as I've grown older, my level of aspiration has kind of gone down and down, but my impact's going up and up and up. You know why? I quit worrying about what I'm not going to change. Let me give you my goal for our fine talk together. Number one, thank you for inviting me. I'm proud to know Dale Carnegie. You guys do great work, and I really believe you should be proud. You're making the world a better place. Thank you. You're helping people, and you're helping people help people. So I think you're doing a multiple good job of making the world a better place. Now, let's talk about my goal on our wonderful talk together here. Ready? Let's imagine that a few people have a little better life based on this call. You know how I feel about this call? It's a good call. That's enough. Well, amen to that. That's certainly our hope and our goal. And I have no doubt that our listeners are going to love this interview and all of the wonderful advice and heartfelt advice that you've offered. Great wisdom. Great generosity, great humility. Thank you so much, Marshall. Really, just truly a pleasure to have you with me here today. 
Thank you so much. Today, we are launching a new segment of the Take Command podcast called the Thought Leadership Spotlight. We will be highlighting a Dale Carnegie principal and a local Dale Carnegie partner who shares an inspirational story amplifying our guest insights as a thought leader and discussing how one principal helped them take command of their career, life, and future. This segment aims to illustrate how by practicing the principles and becoming more confident in ourselves, we can tap into our unsuspected powers, overcome challenges, and achieve success. In this episode, I'm introducing my colleague and friend, Matt Norman. Matt is the president of Dale Carnegie in the North Central United States, who leads a top performing team and speaks on regional and national events. Please join me in welcoming Matt as he expands on Marshall Goldsmith's insights on how courage, humility, and discipline helped him achieve behavioral change and reach his fullest potential. Several years ago in a meeting, as I was preparing to say something and as I was speaking, thoughts of insecurity were racing through my mind. What do people think of me? Am I making any sense? Does this have any value to the meeting? These thoughts produced physical reactions. My stomach got tight and my palms got sweaty. My breath got short and my head got cloudy to the point where I froze. I couldn't continue speaking. Words wouldn't come out of my mouth. People looked at me confused. So I got up out of the meeting. I ran to the restroom, splashed water on my face and realized that I had had a panic attack. If you've had a panic attack or know someone who has, you avoid returning to the place that triggered that panic at all costs. So I avoided going into meetings or speaking up at meetings at all costs. It was a deep fear. I was stuck. So I decided to take action. I did three things. First of all, it required courage, but I enrolled in a Dale Carnegie program to get coaching on being a more confident and effective communicator. Second, I humbled myself in conversations by opening up about my deep fears and processing them with people that I trust and wise counselors. And third, I began the discipline of saying yes to speaking opportunities, to presenting in meetings, to speaking up when I had the opportunity. Marshall Goldsmith says there's three keys to success, courage, humility, and discipline. Recently, I was in a meeting with 750 people, and I was on stage speaking. It was a success because not only did I not have a panic attack, I was calm, confident, and comfortable. Dale Carnegie says that inaction breeds doubt and fear. Action breeds confidence and courage. If you want to conquer fear, don't just sit at home and think about it. Get out and do something. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast. Check out our resources page at www.dalecarnegie.com for more research, insight, and tools that will support your success in taking command of your leadership potential. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating it and subscribing to us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, thank you for listening, and we look forward to you joining us for the next episode of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast.